morning, everyone, and welcome to this session that is looking at uh, HIV and TB lessons from Africa. Uh, we have several presentations. Unfortunately, um, the first presentation in the, in the program, the, the presenter was unable to make it at the last minute, so we will have a little extra time, I think, for both presentations as well as uh, discussions. Uh, I think HIV and TB is an important uh, aspect because that is what most of us in Africa are actually battling with. And uh, we have several different pre uh, presentations this morning looking at infections of HIV seropositive TB, the performance of X-ray screening uh, in HIV positive cases, I think which is important for screening for, for active TB and then uh, the performance of WHO TB symptom screening. And I think importantly, we have actually three presentations on IPT, uh, I think which is very interesting. I think that is one area that we really need to make progress on in Africa. But uh, for us to get, move on, I'd like to invite uh, Leonard Martinez to make his presentation on the infections of HIV seropositive TB patients in Sub-Saharan Africa. Leonardo is a doctoral candidate from the University of Georgia and will be presenting his work that, work that he's done on, on the infections of, of, uh, of HIV TB patients. So hi, so my name is Leo Martinez and I'm gonna be presenting some work um, from my dissertation on um, infectionists of HIV seropositive TB patients in Uganda. So the rationale for this project um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about is that uh, transmission, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa and other um, high burn areas, is really driving um, the epidemic in those areas. And so um, whether HIV-infected tuberculosis cases are less infectious than HIV seronegative cases is somewhat controversial. Um, and most of that is due to very heterogeneous results in a lot of studies. So some studies say they're equally infectious. Some studies say um, HIV seropositive cases are less infectious. Um, but there's some lack of clarity there. Um, a few studies have looked at modifying characteristics of this relationship. So the goal is to, to look at it in a little more in depth. So the study objectives was to compare latent tuberculosis infection and household contacts of HIV seropositive and seronegative TB cases to assess potential modifying variables to this relationship. And then, um, uh, another objective was to evaluate co-prevalent and incident tuberculosis among these contacts and to compare it by um, the HIV serostatus of the index. So just to look at current guidelines uh, based on the 2012 report of um, contact investigation by the WHO. Um, so they suggested uh, tracing contacts of HIV infected cases, index cases but they stipulate that this is based on very low quality evidence. So, um, so more evidence is basically needed is what they suggested. And so we wanted to uh, look at our results and look at the recommendations and see um, if they overlap and, and where. So this, um, what I analyzed for this project was the Kwempe Community Health Study. So it was a large household contact study in Kampala, Uganda. Um, from, and it, I mean, uh, recruitment from it was from 1995 to 2006. And it had a basic household contact study design. So uh, recruited index cases in, in uh, clinics and hospitals in Kampala. Um, then went to uh, all households uh, and uh, recruited all household contacts from those households. And then there was baseline evaluation for uh, latent tuberculosis infection through tuberculosis skin testing and for coprevalent active disease. And we define coprevalent active disease as um, less than or equal to uh, three months from baseline. And then another outcome was incident tuberculosis. So um, all contacts that did not have coprevalent disease at baseline were followed up for two years and were reevaluated for disease every six months. So those are our three main outcomes for this study. And so this is, uh, so that, that was the basic study design of the study. This is how um, we stratified it out for our research questions. And you're gonna see um, a little bit of the results uh, proportion-wise, and then I'll, I'll go into some, some regression analyses after this. 
So there was almost 500 TB index cases and a pretty good uh, distribution of HIV seronegative and seropositive uh, index cases. So 239 seropositive cases um, and 260 HIV seronegative TB cases. And then 915 household contacts of seropositive TB cases and over 1,000 household contacts of seronegative cases. And this is just uh, proportions of our main outcomes. So 66% were TSD positive of contacts of HIV seropositive cases, and uh, a little bit more than 73% for um, contacts of HIV seronegative TB cases. We found um, a little bit more than 4% co-prevalent disease among the whole cohort, and um, almost 2% in both groups um, for incident tuberculosis disease after 24 months. So this is um, a little bit of our main results, and I'm just going to see if this works. Okay, so I'll just explain it. So the crude um, at the top is basically doing a regression analysis, um, comparing latent tuberculosis infection among household contacts of HIV seronegative and seropositive cases, and the seronegative tuberculosis cases are the reference. So what we found was that um, household contacts of seropositive cases were less infectious in the study or did have less latent tuberculosis infection. Um, but what we also found was, um, what we also did was we stratified that by um, many additional modifying variables. So this was a, a, a very detailed study. That there was a lot of variables, so, but uh, we stratified out by everyone I had available to me and we found that the sputum smear status of the index case and the cavitary disease status in this case uh, modify this relationship. So um, if the TB index case was smear negative, we found that they, um, household contacts had less infection. Um, and also, similarly, if the index case was, had non-cavitary disease, they also had less infection. So that, that um, affected the relationship we saw with um, the HIV serostatus of the index case. So what we think is that um, some of the heterogeneous results we're seeing in the past studies um, are partly because um, of these modifying characteristics. Different studies have different proportions of, of, these, um, of these characteristics, smear status and cavitary disease. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that at the very end. And we also um, analyzed co-prevalent and incident disease. And so um, what's important here uh, is two, two important points, is that um, comparing co-prevalent tuberculosis disease um, among contacts of HIV seropositive and seronegative TB cases, we found no differences between the groups. So among all household contacts, um, it was around 3 to 4%, and it, it didn't vary depending on the serostatus of the index case. But when we stratified out by the serostatus of the contact, there was clear differences, um, and which is not unexpected. Uh, but the, the difference is, is um, fairly noticeable here. So over 10% when the, when the contact was seropositive, and 2 to 3 4% when the contact was seronegative. Um, but importantly, not different um, depending on the index case's serostatus. And this was very similar when we looked at incident tuberculosis disease. So um, basically the same bar graph, uh, different numbers and a different outcome, but the same results. So when we um, compared contacts um, with differing HIV ser serostatus, um, sorry, contacts with an index case with differing HIV serostatus, we found no difference or statistical differences between the groups. Um, but when we stratified out by the serostatus of the contact, um, there was very, very large differences. And again, um, 8 to 12 percent um, for when the contact was HIV positive um, in this cohort. So some conclusions from this study. Um, so household contacts of HIV seropositive in this case had less latent infection compared to contacts of HIV seronegative cases um, in this cohort. However, this was modified by cavitary status or sputum smear status. 
Um, and so what we think is some household contacts only recruited smear positive cases, like past um, household contacts, and so may not have picked this up. And some other household contacts, previous ones, um, recruit in index cases with a spectrum of disease. So um, smear negative cases, smear positive cases, and they, they may have picked up a difference. So that may explain some of the heterogeneity that is seen in the literature. Um, but household contacts had similar rates of both co-prevalent and incident disease regardless of the HIV status of the index case. And importantly, uh, one in six contacts of HIV seropositive index cases also had HIV. So um, that drove a lot um, of the disease in these contacts. So some important limitations that um, I have to mention. So it's difficult without molecular genotyping to directly infer transmission, especially with latent tuberculosis, the incubation period is, is very long. Um, we, I did um, a sensitivity analysis with children younger than 15 years old and children younger than five years old, and we found the same results or very similar results, um, but, but still that's a limitation. And so similarly, non-differential non non misclassification is possible because contacts could have been previously exposed. Um, before um, they were exposed in, in the household in the study. And so also important transmission dynamics in the household may be different than the community. And so this relationship we're seeing may be present in the household but not present in the community. And so that, that may be important to investigate in future studies. Um, so lastly, so our findings support um, the current recommendations or the, the 2012 recommendations um, that household contact investigation and active case finding should occur regardless of the HIV sero status of the index case. Um, and so in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, screening for both TB and HIV um, should be performed in household contacts of TB cases. So this is a large, uh, very large study. Um, I am just presenting it, but there were uh, a lot of people on the ground, a lot of people um, that did analysis and um, just a handful are here, so there's a lot more, but I just want to recognize them. Thank you. I think we, we can take a, uh, one or two questions or clarifications, so there will be time for discussion at the end. So do we have any questions or clarifications? I, th I see one, I make one. Hi, uh, Peter McPherson from University of Liverpool. Thank you for the presentation. Thanks. Um, you followed up these household contacts for 24 months. Uh, did you have any differential rates of, follow of, of loss to follow up between the HIV positive contacts and the HIV negative contacts? And might that have led to under ascertainment of TB incidence, particularly amongst the, the HIV positive contacts? No, yeah, that's a good question. Um, and actually, um, I'm not sure the answer. Um, I would have to go back into the data and go back and ask um, some other people that worked on the study. But that's definitely, it's possible there's some differential follow-up, but I'm not sure, good question. Possibly while uh, other people are uh, thinking of their question, you mentioned children, and I'm not sure whether you were leading me into this question, but uh, would, uh, would young children not be a more uh, precise method of estimating the relative infectiousness of HIV seropositive and seronegative individuals? Uh, do you mean con child contacts? Yes, child. Yeah, child so contacts. definitely I think that would be, um, and so we did a sensitivity analysis with younger children, younger contacts. So all of this analysis here we also did um, stratified by younger than 15 years old and then younger than 5 years old. Um, and that, that might be more accurate. It's a little bit um, tricky because maybe children are on the household more. And um, so I, I mean maybe the transmission dynamics among children are, are very different among adults. So, so I kind of just did it um, among very young children, children, and then everyone. And, and it was all the same direction? All the same, yeah. Okay. There was uh, no differences, no other modifying variables, and still these two variables modified the relationship. So hopefully that, that um, the non-differential misclassification from being previously infected may be, may be um, controlled a little bit by that. Um, but yeah, good question. I see a hey. mic number two, yeah? Hello, yeah. Shekhan, um, London School hey. of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Hello, thank you for your presentation. Thanks. Um, so 
correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding was that this was over quite a long period of time. The study period was from nine, the late 1990s to 2006. Is yeah. That, yeah. So did you stratify by calendar period? Because during that period of time, you had rollout of ART. Yeah. Uh, no, we didn't do that. I think it, um, it would be interesting to do that. Um, I don't have that data, and I might need to go back um, to the original the original people to get that data, but that, that definitely might be interesting. Um, I don't think this, I mean, clearly because it, it ended around the time when ART would have um, started up a lot, um, probably most of these contacts and, and index cases were, were not on ART and, and probably had, um, so it's, it's difficult. But if I had like ART levels of, of index cases, that, that would have really um, helped the analysis a lot. I suppose, and also the, the, where patients got diagnosed during their HIV, the natural history of their HIV. So were those more immunosuppressed earlier on because people were yeah. diagnosed late? So no, yeah. So that's a really good question. Um, we don't have CD4 counts for the index cases, and, and there's been a couple um, recent studies that have looked at infectiousness of um, HIV um, TB index cases with low CD4 count and with high CD4 count, and found a difference. And, and I think partly these results may um, corroborate those results because we're seeing people with um, very severe TB disease, so with cavitary disease and with uh, smear positive rates. Um, it may corroborate those studies. But, but yeah, if we had CD4, that, that would have been ideal. Thank Thanks. We can take one last question. Uh, Jerry Freeland, Yale University. Hi. Uh, oops. Um, I'm interested uh, in uh, you followed patients on multiple occasions over time and household contacts on multiple occasions. Was there a difference in the pickup over time? That is, how efficient was actually the um, yield uh, at different points in time? Um, uh, did it fall off over time? Uh, and this gets at the issue of um, how how long you need to follow people in the household to actually have a substantial yield of household transmission? Yeah, so that's a good question. So I think it did it did um, drop off a little bit. So it, there was a high yield at the beginning, and then right. and then it dropped off. How far um, down did it go by the end? Um, I mean, there were still cases being picked up at the end. I don't know the exact numbers, and I I don't have a graph um, that I could show here, but. Uh, or I have one, but I didn't add it. It has here. practical implications yeah. in terms of resources and how no, definitely. you would actually be able to do this in the real life situation. Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, also, if you, like, how long the follow up is an issue for, like, sample size and, and for the analysis, also. I mean, maybe if we had followed up longer, we may have um, been able to pick up more power, um, but also for practical implications, like programmatic implications, also. So, um, but I know it dropped off. I just don't know the numbers. Okay, thank you. But good question. Thank you very much. Perhaps there may be more uh, time at the end. Thank you, Leonardo. Thank you. Uh, our next presentation was, <laughs> was supposed to come from Rwanda. And I wonder if uh, V. Mutabazi is in the audience. Perhaps there's been a delay somewhere. So we can then move on to the next presentation, which is by uh, Lisa Kramer. Lisa is an assistant professor at Emory University uh, in pediatric infectious diseases, and she's going to uh, give us a presentation on the performance of the WHO sympt TB symptom screen in hospitalized HIV positive Kenyan children. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to present our work. In 2011, the WHO uh, issued guidelines to establish symptom screening as the key foundation for improving TB prevention and intensified case finding among people living with HIV and AIDS. Those who screen positive are referred for additional diagnostic evaluation for TB, including sputum, uh, smear, and culture, as well as chest X-ray, and those who screen negative are referred for initiation of isoniazid preventive therapy. The adult WHO TB symptom screen was established using an evidence base of a meta-analysis of over 8,000 HIV-infected adults. Ad all adults were screened uh, with sputum culture for TB disease, and TB disease was de defined as a positive culture. The study found that the combination of one or more fever, cough, weight loss, or night sweats 
and was the best performing combination of symptoms. In contrast, the pediatric WHO screen was, uh, the evidence behind it was from a single study of HIV infected children, only 325 children, and TB disease was not confirmed in the majority of these cases. The final recommended WHO pediatric screen was convened by a panel of experts who recommended that a combination of fever, cough, TB contact, or poor weight gain as uh, the screen to be included in the guidelines. Poor weight gain was included as report of a weight loss or objective uh, findings of documented weight loss or a low weight for HC score. The adult WHO TB symptom screen has a sensitivity of 79% with a specificity of 50% and a negative predictive value of 97%. However, there are no studies to date to evaluate the performance of the pediatric WHO TB symptom screen. Our study aimed to first assess the performance of the screen in a, in a, a cohort of HIV-infected hospitalized children, and to secondly develop a modified screening tool to optimize TB screening in this population. Our study was nested within a clinical trial of HIV-infected children who were hospitalized for any reason in Nairobi and Kasumu, Kenya. Children were aged 12 years and younger and were ART naive. We excluded children with any signs or symptoms of CNS infection. For all children enrolled in the study, we as comprehensively assessed TB symptoms and collected samples for microbiologic confirmation of TB disease. We collected two samples for gastric aspirates uh, sent for liquid culture, two gastric aspirates for expert, or one gastric aspirate for expert and one stool expert. We also performed chest x-rays, tuberculin skin testing on all children, and children who were t treated for TB, uh, we assessed treatment response at six months. We first assessed the performance characteristics of the WHO TB screen based on confirmed cases. So children with culture positive or positive expert were defined as TB cases compared to those without confirmed TB. We then performed sensitivity analyses using different definitions of TB disease. First using a combination of confirmed and probable to cases to define TB disease. And second, to uh, join confirmed, probable, and possible cases to define our TB case. To develop an optimized screening tool, we used 14 symptoms um, based on the NIH consensus criteria, uh, as well as other literature, including respiratory symptoms, TB exposure history, as well as constitutional syndrome sy symptoms. We used um, all possible combinations uh, between two and four symptoms using a best subset selection model um, with SAS. And as we wanted to um, attain a screening tool that was very highly sensitive, we used the criteria of two times the sensitivity plus the specificity to select our, uh, the best tool as previously performed by uh, Kane and colleagues. For our cohort, the median age was 1.9 years about half were male, and children were severely immunosuppressed with a median CD4% of 15%. Children had low weight for HZ scores with a, minus, a median of minus 2.3, and 8% of our uh, cohort had confirmed TB disease. 6% were probable, and 23% were possible. So to first assess the performance of the WHO pediatric screen, we found this screen was 100% sensitive, 4% specific, and with a high negative predictive value of 100%. In performing sensitivity analyses, uh, the performance of the screen did not change uh, when combining confirmed and probable cases, and also was quite similar oops, uh, when we combined confirmed, probable, and possible cases, so it decreased the negative predictive value by 13%. In um, using um, the pediatric WHO screen, uh, we found that we did not miss any cases of TB disease among those who screened negative. However, 96% of the children in our co cohort screened positive, and this would require um, diagnostic evaluation, including chest x-ray, tuberculin skin testing, collection of invasive specimens by gastric aspirate, um, and sputum or an, an nasopharyngeal aspirate. And as my pediatric colleagues know, this is very difficult in children um, to obtain the specimens. It's costly and it's inefficient. Uh, it takes several days to obtain. So secondly, we aim to develop a modified screening tool to optimize TB screening in HIV-infected children. 
Uh, as a reminder, we use the selection score of two times the sensitivity plus the specificity. And here, um, among all the combinations that we assessed, I, I demonstrated the um, six top combinations in comparison to the WHO TB, pediatric TB screen. So um, the letters on the y-axis demonstrate the symptoms that were included in the various combinations. So for example, the WHO pediatric screen at the bottom, E stands for TB exposure, P for poor weight gain, F for fever, and C for cough, and so on for the other combinations. And here we found that the combination of TB exposure or weight loss was the best performing, performance, performing um, screen. This screen had a, a sensitivity of 93% with a specificity of 60% and a negative predictive value of 99%. When performing our sensitivity analyses, uh, our results did not significantly change when combining um, confirmed and probable disease as our TB case definition. When we combined um, confirmed, probable, and possible, our, um, the screen had more modest performance. So using uh, this modified screen of reporting either TB contact or weight loss, uh, we identified 44% of the cohort uh, to require further diagnostic evaluation. And so this significantly decreased our, the number of children that we would require additional diagnostic evaluation. We also missed few cases of TB disease, and only 1% of children who screened negative actually had confirmed TB disease. When comparing the receiver operating characteristics of the screening tools, we found that the modified pediatric screen of TB exposure or weight loss had significantly improved uh, area under the curve compared to the performance of the WHO pediatric TB screen or the adult um, WHO screen in our population. Limitations of our study include that um, this was a population of hospitalized children, which may limit its generalizability, and we had a small sample size, which may limit the precision of our findings. However, the strengths of our study are that we confirmed TB disease in HIV-infected children independent of TB symptoms, and to our knowledge, this is the first study that has done this. And secondly, uh, we performed comprehensive clinical TB classification with longitudinal follow-up for all of the children. In conclusion, the WHO pediatric screen was highly sensitive with a high negative predictive value. However, its specificity was poor at only 4%. Development of a modified TB um, TB screening tool of weight loss or TB exposure for children had improved overall performance, resulting in less children requiring TB eva diagnostic evaluation. And future studies to evaluate an optimal screening tool in HIV-infected children and assess uh, cost-effectiveness is certainly warranted. I'd like to thank uh, the large team of individuals that made this work possible, uh, collaborators at the University of Nairobi, Kemri, University of Washington, and the hospital staff as well as the generous support of our funding agencies, including the NICHD and the Pediatric Scientist Development Program. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. The uh, presentation is open now for any questions or clarifications. You could come to the mic. Yes, number three. Yeah, Lisa Nelson, um, Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator for PEPFAR. Thanks for an excellent presentation, and I think we really need more data uh, in children uh, and, and better diagnostic tests. I guess one thing is hospitalized children are the sickest, so I'm wondering as a future effort if you're looking at uh, outpatient analyses. Obviously, it's harder to collect specimens, but we'd prefer to diagnose these children well before they, they get hospitalized. Secondly, you had a relatively small number of confirmed cases, which is obviously a challenge, but I'm wondering whether you feel your study was sufficiently powered to really look at, at TB diagnosis and stratification. Yeah, so for the first question, I mean, that's the inherent strength and the weakness of the study, um, that, that it was being hospitalized children, and so these children, uh, we could actually obtain gastric aspirates for in three sequential days um, for these children. And, um, and though certainly the generalizability is, is the main issue. So I do think this certainly needs to be validated in future populations. However, there is, are challenges, um, particularly uh, at the time of the study, there wasn't as much evidence for, for less invasive specimens, such as nasopharyngeal aspirates. So performing gastric aspirates in an outpatient population was not really justifiable ethically um, to, to ethics boards. Um, so, so certainly I do think that as we roll out more less invasive methods, such as the stool expert and nasopharyngeal aspirates in outpatient populations, that it would be optimal to uh, assess this performance of, of, of various tools, um, and maybe even the top several of these tools uh, in those populations. 
Um, and then your second question, I asked, remind me. Yes, yeah, certainly there was, this was a small number. Um, this was the, also the, the only study that's, that's assessed this comprehensively independent of symptoms um, for children. Most children are referred for TB evaluation based on their symptoms, and so to actually assess is a, a, almost a circular analysis. analysis. Um, so I, I, admittedly, we did have a small sample size. Yeah. Mike number one. Mm -hmm. Hello, uh, Hugh Adler from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Um, thank you for a very interesting and well-presented pres um, well study and re really well-conducted, I thought. Um, my one question, and I'll confess that I'm not, I'm not a full-time pediatrician, but about the choosing gastric aspirate over sputum, I wonder, is that standard local practice or w w whether any consideration was given to trying for sputum? Because my understanding is that still sputum would be more sensitive in children than gastric aspirate, albeit harder to collect. And I wonder, could you could you explain a bit the, the decision that went into that, please. Well, if you think about a one-year-old, <laughs> um, producing sputum is quite difficult, right? So, um, so really this is the, the standard of care for pediatrics, is obtaining gastric aspirate specimens for children who are not able to um, produce sputum. And certainly if children um, you know, were old enough and able to produce sputum, there are a few children in our study that, that produce sputum, but um, for those younger children, you, know, you saw the median age of our cohort was 1.9 years. Uh, and obtaining gastric aspirates was the only method to confirm by culture. So, so just clarify, in, in children who were old enough, were sputum samples obtained then? Yes. Okay. Yeah, Thank but you. that was very few children in our cohort. Thank you. We can take one more question. Thank you. Uh, I'm Olivier Marcy from University of Bordeaux. Thanks. It's a g great study, amazing talk. Uh, how do you cope with the fact that, in fact, th your predictors, uh, weight loss and contact, they are also used to classify the children. So we have a, a similar study trying to come up not with a screening, screening tool, but a diagnosis tool in HIV-infected children. And, it's, and we are kind of, we don't know how to handle this because they are in both, you see, dimension of your table. They are, cl they are classifying the children f and, and, they are, and then you try to predict. Uh, you see what I mean? In, in terms of methods, that's <coughs> something that is unclear. Right, that's why our main method was to identify a culture confirmation. So um, confirmed TB disease, and that was assessed independent of symptoms. So in each hospitalized child that was admitted for pneumonia, malnutrition, gastroenteritis, uh, had a sputum um, uh, or a, a gastric aspirate specimen sent for culture independent of symptoms. So I think that is one of the strengths of the study. We have one, one question from the podium. Lisa, that's a great um, uh, study and thanks for sharing it with us. I just wanted to know in this day and age when uh, the number of HIV infected kids is, is really shrinking, uh, how applicable do you think your findings are to HIV exposed children and HIV uninfected children? Yeah, it's a great question, um, and I think that you know remains to be seen. And uh, you know, as we have increased diagnostic tools for children, you know, uh, for HIV infected and uninfected children, uh, we need to continue to assess this. Um, but I do think that this may have um, generalizability potentially to HIV exposed and uninfected children. Um, however, you know, particularly with the weight loss, uh, I, I do wonder if that might be more specific to the HIV infected population. But we'll have to see. Do I see one? Uh, my name is James. I'm from Kenya. I read study there. Um, <coughs> I realize in your ex exclusion criteria, you took away children who were unconscious or uh, had a low uh, uh, Glasgow coma scale. And um, my worry is uh, that TB meningitis is a known, um, you know, uh, complication of uh, TB. And by excluding that uh, population, do you think you probably missed a great number of uh, those who probably had TB? Uh, maybe what were the reasons for your exclusion? Thank oh, yeah, the reasons were for the parent clinical trial. We were assessing ART initiation, and so uh, we didn't want to start ART on children that had TB meningitis or cryptococcal meningitis um, for, for risk of a, a, a poor outcome for that. So that's why we excluded it. So certainly this would only be generalizable to uh, children with intrathoracic TB. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, Neil Martinson. I'm from South Africa uh, in Soweto from the Perinatal HIV Research Unit. And uh, we'll be going on to the next speaker. Uh, so uh, um, our next speaker will be Colleen Hanrahan, who is uh, on faculty at uh, the School of Public Health, uh, Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. 
and has done a lot of work in South Africa, some of it with, uh, with the PHRU, and uh, she'll be sharing with us uh, patient preferences for isonized preventive treatment among HIV-infected individuals in South Africa. Thanks, and thanks for the opportunity to present this work, which, uh, as Neil mentioned, was conducted in collaboration with the Perinatal HIV Research Unit. Uh, we know that uh, global implementation of uh, isoniazid preventive therapy remains poor, even though we have good evidence of its effectiveness. Um, in the, from the most recent WHO report, 70% of high HIV TB burden countries don't report any provision of IPT for, uh, as part of routine HIV care. South Africa has kind of led the way globally in terms of numbers, but in 2015, they only reported 38% of eligible people living with HIV were started on IPT. And we see this reflected here uh, in this graph from the, from the report showing that South Africa is providing the lion's share of initiation on IPT and that it has even tailed off in the last couple of years. In terms of the reasons for poor IPT uptake, I mean, they kind of stretch across from the health system level um, to providers, um, to patients, and I'm going to focus today on talking about uh, exploring some of the reasons for, for uh, poor uptake among patients. So from the literature, we've, we've seen that some of these reasons could be poor health literacy, uh, issues around HIV, stigma and disclosure, um, the idea of taking medication for prevention versus curative medication, um, issues with adherence over the long regimen, and then uh, pill burden and fatigue when especially combined with ART. So the objectives of this study were to try to quantify um, patient preferences for IPT provision so that we can design patient-centered implementation strategies to improve uptake. This, uh, this study was nested within a cluster randomized trial called TICO, um, and that study is com comparing quantifiron gold to TFT for IPT initiation. The study was conducted in uh, 14 public primary health care clinics in Matlasana, South Africa, which is right there where the yellow star is. <clears throat> it was a cross-sectional study in which we enrolled uh, newly diagnosed, that being within the last six months, uh, HIV cases who were adults over, over the age of 18. Uh, we did an interview for demographics, took a clinical history, and then we assessed um, preferences around isoniazid preventive therapy. So for the methods, we used stated preference methods, which come out originally from uh, marketing research, but have now been more and more applied, particularly in terms of investigating patients and what patients want in terms of treatment um, and, and, and their health states. So we use these stated preference methods to explore three aspects of IPT provision and uptake. And I'm going to speak today about the last one, which are st structural interventions to improve IPT uptake. <coughs> so for this, uh, we conceptualized uh, seven different attributes of how IPT could be provided. And for each attribute that I have listed here, uh, that we have three levels that we asked patients about. Um, so the, the seven attributes were the type of screening test used to determine eligibility, um, the, the p how the pill was provided, whether it was combined with medication, other medications or not, uh, the, the perception of effectiveness, how long the treatment was, what the medication purpose was as told to you by your clinician or healthcare provider, uh, how the medication is picked up uh, for example, at a fast track in the clinic, um, in a pickup point in the community, um, and how treatment is supported. So the way that this looked um, in the, as we ask patients about it, uh, we would provide a profile where the uh, different levels for each of the seven attributes were selected and presented to the patient saying, if this was how uh, IPT could be provided to you. Um, please choose what you think the best attribute of this is and the worst. And so for each question, they would choose one best aspect and one worst. And then 
these uh, questions were repeated in different iterations 18 times so that everyone saw um, the same number of uh, um, attributes and levels um, over the course of the 18 questions. In terms of the participants that we enrolled, uh, we enrolled 334 participants, and these generally look like what we know um, newly diagnosed HIV patients to look like in South Africa. They were on average 34 years. Two-thirds of them were women. Um, they had been diagnosed on average about a month earlier. 56% had started on ART, and 35% had started and were currently on IPT. Um, um, they were, uh, in general, had a sort of low perception of the risk of getting TB and spent about five hours on average waiting at the clinic to see a, a provider for, for, for a visit. So let me orient you to how these results look. So what, what, we, what we use here is the best worst score, and that's what's on the, the y-axis. And that's just the number of times a particular level was chosen as best minus the number of times it was chosen as worst over the total number of times it could have been chosen. And so the more positive numbers indicate that something was more preferred by patients and the negative ones less preferred. And so it's divided here across the seven attributes that we looked at and then each of the three levels of these attributes. So I'm going to focus on a few things here. Um, firstly, the provider messaging. So this is what providers told patients in terms of uh, why they were prescribing them IPT, and we tested three messages that it makes you stronger, that it prevents TB, and that it's just part of your regular HIV medication. And all of those were uh, highly preferred by patients, really just kind of showing that if providers tell patients anything, really, about why they're taking this, if they explain them just a little bit, um, that patients like that. In terms of the pill combinations, we saw that combining with ART or cotrimoxazole were very popular with patients um, in terms of a, a motivator to uh, make treatment easier for them. And then uh, for treatment support, we saw that uh, Simple interventions such as counseling at the clinic visit, which is actually standard of care and what should be happening, were, were very supported by patients, followed by some SMS messaging support, and they were less enthusiastic about um, uh, treatment support visits by a, by a healthcare worker at their home. And similarly, with the medication pickup, uh, we saw that kind of the simplest thing was was most preferred by patients, which is just picking it up at their regular clinic visit. Um, they were uh, picking it up at a clinic fast track visit was uh, less preferred, possibly because people perceived this as an extra uh, visit that they would have to make outside of their regular clinic visits. And then community pickup points were also not supported by patients. And then interestingly, in terms of the screening test that's used to determine eligibility, um, a blood test, which was, would be something like the quantifiron, uh, was people were fairly neutral about that, did, did not like the skin test, but really didn't want no test at all. So they seemed to want to have some test to determine whether they were eligible to take IPT or not. Um, so in conclusion, we saw that uh, Provider messaging was, was welcome and kind of supported by patients in order to give them some information about why they're taking IPT. But some of the interventions that were most preferred were really the simplest counseling and SMS messaging for treatment support. Um, there was less support for community-based interventions, such as pickup points in the community or delivery by community health workers. And we saw a strong preference for combinations with uh, ART and cotrimoxazole, potentially. And, and then it, it could be that this uh, may be on the horizon as a, as, a, as a sort of simple and effective intervention for how to, to um, get more people um, started on IPT, especially in the context of maybe lifelong IPT. Um, so thank you uh, to the field teams at 
did all these interviews and work, um, and um, my uh, uh, funding source for this work. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, people with questions, could you go up to the mics? At mic number two. Lisa Adams from Dartmouth in the US. Thank you for an excellent presentation. We know that sometimes providers are um, also resistant to IPT and have their own sort of biases and concerns, and I'm wondering if you could talk about um, what kind of provider training you did to get them on board so that they could actually positively present these messages to patients. Yeah, um, of course, providers are a part of, the, a part of this. Maybe they, maybe even a larger part than the patients. Um, and so uh, in these clinics, there was, uh, as part of the um, parent study, there was uh, some uh, provider training um, on, on the guidelines that were supposed to be standard of care in South Africa. Um, we have another study ongoing that's comparing um, intensified provider training, uh, like a mentoring, um, not too intensive, but more than just providing like a seminar on the guidelines. Um, and so comparing um, provider mentoring for IPT uh, to, to some other patient interventions to see which one has a stronger uh, uh, effect of getting people started on IPT, and we'll, we'll see what happens. I mean, I think that is uh, really necessary. Unfortunately, just having guidelines doesn't seem to, to cut it in terms of what's needed for providers. Go ahead. Um, great talk, thank you for that. Um, my name is Sean Cavanaugh, I'm with the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator. Um, it, it, was, it was interesting to see that they had such a low perception of risk. And I'm wondering if you had stratified, if you had looked at more closely at those that had a higher perception of risk for TB and and I'm wondering what the role for community service organizations would be to sort of educate the pa and providers to educate the, the patients mm -hmm. around w what we're doing and why, and if that would alter some of the responses that, that you presented. I didn't stratify there only because we ha there were so few people that actually perceived themselves to be at high risk. Um, I think it was uh, under 5% that really felt that they had a high chance of getting TB. Um, and I, one, uh, in this uh, study that's ongoing right now, um, I mentioned that we're doing pa patient interventions, and the patient intervention in that study is a, a small educational session in the waiting queue to say, you know, people with HIV are at high risk of TB. This TB is the number one killer of people with HIV, um, and and to try to get to build some patient demand, um, to just go to your clinician and say, look, I I know that I could get TB, and I know that. IPT can help me not get TB. Can it, can you see if I'm eligible? Uh, we'll, we'll see. Go ahead. Hi, Sylvia Lacourse from the University of Washington. I was really interested in the stark contrast between easier is better and preferred by participants, except when you look at what um, whether or not they were interested in a screening test. So all of those were negative. Mm -hmm. But the least negative choice seemed to be a blood test in contrast to no test at all. And I, I was curious, did you also do qualitative work um, to, to dig into that a little deeper to see why that was? No, um, we didn't do any follow-up qualitative work. We did do qualitative work to, um, to formulate what these uh, ideas were. Um, I think we... we we really included that question because that was what the main trial was about, was mm -hmm. about um, quantifying versus TST. I think, but in thinking about it, I think that in general people mm -hmm. like to feel like they've had in it some intervention and that you know, you're not just prescribing them treatment uh, willy-nilly, that there's a reason behind it why you're, why you're doing that. Um, mm -hmm. People feel better when they have a diagnostic test done that says, yes or no, you should have this or you shouldn't have it. So that's my thinking behind it, but I haven't, we had, didn't do any follow-up qualitative work on that, so. So, uh, Colleen, maybe a follow-up question on that. How do you interpret the, those um, numbers that are slightly minus or slightly positive? Um, even though I know the confidence intervals don't include the, yeah. the baseline, but how, would you just say, well, that it, people really don't have a preference, or where would you say that it's starting to, 
you know, people are starting to identify that this is mm. something they really want or this is something they don't want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so something around zero was said to be people are indifferent to that, but it, it actually can mean that equal numbers of people preferred it and didn't, uh, liked it and didn't like it. Um, so that's where some, some stratified analysis could come in to try to find out uh, is this something that people truly are indifferent to? They just never really choose this or um, are there some groups in here that I could separate out and find, oh, these people strongly preferred and these people um, didn't. When we did stratify this analysis by uh, ART status, um, by gender, by uh, uh, IPT status, we didn't see any differences at all in these preferences, so. Okay, Jerry. Yes, thank you. That was really excellent. Um, so I wanted to make a comment about something that we've learned that is relevant in doing the similar kind of work in rural KwaZulu-Natal, and that is that TB is much more stigmatized than HIV, and um, people don't like to think that they're at risk, although if you ask the question, do you know someone who's died of TB in a very high prevalence area, almost everybody does. And... Um, so I, I think there's a disconnect between actually wanting to admit that you're at risk for TB and actually knowing that you are. Um, and um, when we sort of posed it that way and said, did you know that there was a way of preventing TB, people had no idea that there was, and they were tremendously interested in actually participating. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the issue of language and question and belief is very much embedded in how people might answer these questions. Yeah, we, we did have a question about, do you know anyone who's mm -hmm. been diagnosed with TBI? I think off the top of my head, I think it was around 15% of people, 15 or 20% okay. did, did know someone. It, but yeah, that's not reflected in their own personal perception of, of risk. I mean, I think uh, one of the motivators for doing this study was, was wondering why there is so very little patient demand, why there's not more, you know, everyone wants to take ART, People seem to gladly take cotrimoxazole, but IPT is just. Uh, I think it might have something yeah. to do with the perception of risk for tuberculosis, as mm. you pointed out. Um, uh, and also the marketing of antiretroviral therapy and the fact that people are very confused and have very much less information about tuberculosis than HIV. Mm. Agreed, yeah. Thank you very much. And I think, uh, Jerry, uh, that um, observation is uh, reflected in the, in the content of what we have here today, is that none of these, uh, um, none of the presentations really deal with uh, antiretrovirals and TB. But that's just, uh, <laughs> that's just an observation. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Lisa Adams, who is the Associate Dean for Global Health and, the associate, and an Associate Professor in the Infectious Disease and International Health section at Dartmouth's uh, Giesel Medical School which uh, is in the US, not in the UK. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be able to present our work on uh, interventions to improve isonized and preventive therapy delivery to patients with HIV in Swaziland. And you will see it very nicely dovetails with the um, previous presentation. I'm presenting on behalf of colleagues at Dartmouth and also at URC and the National TB and HIV Control Programs in Swaziland, several of whom I acknowledge here. So Colleen just did a nice job of, of summarizing a little bit about what we do know about IPT, and I know this audience is very familiar with the data showing that IPT is effective and results in a significant reduction in incident TB and HIV-infected individuals, and that this benefit is only enhanced if it's combined with antiretroviral therapy. We also know that IPT has been endorsed by WHO for many years, and many uh, country ministries of health have endorsed it as policy. Nonetheless, we also know, as we saw too, that globally uptake of IPT has been poor. Too few HIV patients are receiving IPT, and this, again, is due to many reasons, but certainly in part due to con provider concerns about breakthrough TB and also programmatic concerns about ensuring TB, um, ITP treatment completion. What we don't know about ITP is what's the best means of delivering it, um, as we heard. Uh, and I and some colleagues conducted a systematic overview of interventions to improve IPT adherence a couple years ago, 
And what we found is that we don't know the best method of delivery. There was no magic um, intervention that consistently improved IPT adherence. Um, at best, we learned that only the integration of TB and HIV in services yielded high treatment completion rates in some high burden settings. Now in Swaziland, IPT rollout began in 2011. Um, however, in a 2014 retrospective chart review that our team conducted looking at IPT outcomes at four facilities, we learned that less than 10% of those who were eligible for IPT were actually started on it, and only about a third, third of those who started actually completed it. This led to us conducting our study of IPT delivery methods. This was a prospective cohort study looking at three different delivery models conducted in five HIV facilities in Swaziland, four enrolling primarily um, adults and one enrolling pr primarily children. Now, two important features about our um, study, the two unique characteristics were that first, patients were allowed to select, they were not assigned to their IPT delivery model. The um, delivery models were developed after broad stakeholder and patient input, and they included the following. First, routine facility-based delivery, where patients would come to the clinic as they always had to pick up their IPT. Community-based delivery, which was uh, usually meant patients received um, IPT in their home or at another um, designated place in the community by a, a clinic nurse or using a peer support model in which patients joined a peer support group and then they would actually rotate taking turns to pick up um, the medicines for all the members in the support group. Secondly, we aligned the INH refills with ART refills. We made um, IPT part of the ART package and we just folded it into the ART refill um, system so that patients would be picking up their IPT with their ART at whatever interval they were already receiving their refills on, which was based on their adherence history. So that could be at one, two, or three month intervals. Of course, we conducted um, extensive healthcare worker training. Um, and our training actually included motivational interviewing techniques where clinici for clinicians where they actually learned how to gauge what matters most to patients. Um, we had a target enrollment of 826 patients. We enrolled patients consecutively. And we use the eligibility criteria of the National TB Program for IPT as our inclusion criteria, making this um, under programmatic conditions. We allowed patients to switch their IPT delivery model at any time. And we use standard adherence measurements of pill counts, uh, self-report, and selected home visits. We measured adherence as the percent of uh, prescribed pills that were ingested and considered 80% or more um, as optimal adherence. We used a standard uh, definition of treatment completion of IPT, and we used standardized data collection tools and software for data analysis. So here are our results. We enrolled 908 patients in total, two-thirds were female, um, with a median age of 38 years with quite a, a broad age span. I'll mention that 34 of the 908 were children under the age of 18. 40% were urban residents, and the vast majority were already on ART. Now, in terms of IPT model delivery choice, most patients, 88%, chose facility-based um, delivery. Only 12% chose community-based, and nobody chose the um, peer support model. We didn't systematically collect information on why patients made uh, their choice, uh, one particular choice of uh, delivery. However, anecdotally, our clinic nurses said things like, well, patients said they already had their routine for picking up their ART, so they didn't want to interfere with their regular routine. They talked about um, um, appreciating the confidentiality that, that picking up medicines at the clinic versus having a healthcare worker come to their house um, afforded, where uh, that could be seen uh, by their neighbors. So those were some of the reasons that we anecdotally heard from patients. These are results of adherence at the first visit based on the IPT delivery model. And looking at optimal adherence, you can see we achieved very high adherence rates, 98% in the facility-based model and 94% in the community-based model. And when we stratified, there were no significant differences between any of the five sites or between the two delivery models. As I said, we allowed patients to switch their delivery model at any time. However, very few in the facility-based model ever switched 
um, but about half of the community-based model switched at least once. Looking at patients who discontinued IPT, it was consistently about 6% in both uh, delivery models. The vast majority discontinued for um, adverse drug reactions, but smaller numbers due to high pill burden, poor adherence, and erratic NIH, INH supply due to um, an, a nationwide shortage that occurred temporarily, and then 15 for other reasons. And these included everything from patients kind of lost interest or um, chose uh, for personal reasons not to continue IPT to becoming pregnant to being incarcerated. We only had one um, severe case of hepatotoxicity in an adult who was um, hospitalized uh, but fully recovered um, when IPT was discontinued. This summarizes our um, IPT treatment outcomes. So of, of the 908 patients that were screened and offered and accepted IPT, and I will mention too that we actually did not capture those that refused IPT because the nurses said it was such a rare event. Essentially everybody that was offered IPT um, accepted it, if not at the first visit, at a follow-up visit. So of the 908, looking at those um, in the facility-based model at enrollment, 89% completed treatment. We had very few loss to follow up and only one death in that cohort. Of the community-based uh, patients, we had 91% uh, completing treatment and again, very few loss to follow up and one additional death. Now, both of these deaths were in adults and they were determined not to be due to TB. Patients were screened for TB at each visit um, and we found presumptive TB to be very rare during follow-up. They were screened using the standardized symptom questionnaire. 19 patients screened positive at least once. And they were evaluated fully with exam, chest x-ray, expert, and or culture, and all had TB excluded. 17 of those resumed IPT. So in conclusion, we had very high adherence and treatment completion rates among our cohort with no difference between the two delivery models. Facility-based model being most popular, why might that be? Again, we think it had to do with patients sort of being able to continue on with their regular routines, but we'd like to understand a little bit more about that. And we had no cases of confirmed, bacteriologically confirmed breakthrough TB. We had some limitations, of course, those that are common to these kinds of adherence um, studies, having to rely on patient self-report. Um, we had some difficulty standardizing adherence measurements because of the different intervals um, between refills, and again, the um, INH shortage uh, that occurred temporarily caused us to have to use 100 milligram tablets, which we know um, increased the pill burden and may have affected patients' adherence. So. If in terms of recommendation and next steps, we certainly would recommend that a six-month course of patient-selected IPT and ART delivery should be offered as a comprehensive HIV care package. Um, in Swaziland, they're moving to national rollout. Um, and in thinking about why we had such high adherence and treatment completion rates, we want to understand more about that. So our next step is to do some of the qualitative studies to assess what was the uh, magic factor here. Was it how patients, uh, how providers presented IPT to patients? Was it the impact of motivational interviewing? Was it the fact that patients, perhaps for the first time, had a choice in their care delivery, and that got them engaged in their care in a different way? Or was it simply the convenience of aligning um, IPT and ART refills? Um, and we certainly would uh, recommend considering implementation of this model in similar high TB burden settings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? At microphone two. Yeah, uh, Lisa Nelson again. Thanks for a really terrific presentation, and I think you um, provided some answers on a lot of things we've all been thinking about. Um, I guess in thinking about the new push for latent TB infection more broadly, not just in the HIV context, mm -hmm. the other group, and this is kind of a question to you, but some of the other presenters, um, who really benefit from it are children under five. And I'm, I'm wondering also as a future uh, effort if you thought about maybe combining um, you know, strategies to reach children under five who may or may not have HIV exposure or HIV in the household with efforts to reach adults with IPT. 
Great question. We actually would have accepted children under five who were contacts because um, they would have been eligible by Swaziland um, national TB program guidelines. Um, however, it, it just so happened that all of our patients were HIV infected using our consecutive enrollment method. But I absolutely think that this is, this is something that could be easily uh, transferred over to um, children under five and should be. Okay, microphone two. Hi, um, that was a good presentation. I'm Yao, National TB Program, Ghana. Mm -hmm. Looking at the high adherence rate, did you, I did not hear you mention anything about the geographical access, which is very important in our settings in Africa. How long, um, what was the accessibility? And then getting to the health facility, how long did they have to stay? Were they part of the general patient population or they had to be segregated and go for their drugs? These were, I think, very important mm -hmm. considerations. Yes. Um, so in terms of our um, breakdown by geographic distribution, as I said, 40% were urban, but probably another 40% were um, peri-urban and, and a smaller percentage were in rural um, communities. And as you might um, imagine it was actually those living in rural communities that were selecting the um, community-based care and preferred to have someone um, deliver their IPT to their home. So that was a breakdown that we're still going to do some further analysis on, but that, that was typically ha how, um, how it broke down. Um, I do think that those in urban and peri-urban areas had very um, short commuting distances to uh, access their, their facility. So that you know, may also, um, of course, lead to it, uh, why we had such high um, adherence rates. Patients um, were receiving their, again, their IPT was just part of their a um, AP ART package, so they would go to pick up their ARTs, and that system's pretty well streamlined, so waiting times were minimal for that. Um, we didn't collect um, information on that, but that's something that in the qualitative assessment that we might be interested in going back to find out. Because, but it seems like that was, that's sort of an automatic system that's already part of their HIV care. Okay, go ahead. I'm Sean Cavanaugh again. Thank you. That was, that was a very exciting talk for us. Um, you may know that PEPFAR is now going to require reporting on IPT going forward, which which we anticipate means that a lot of our countries are going to pick up this programming. And understanding exactly how you were as, as successful as you were could be very useful to us. So I'm, I'm very eager to learn as you unpack the rest of this. Um, I guess my question would be about um, what specifically the clinician said when they introduced and educated the patient about this, because I, I feel like there's something there that sort of that, that encouraged the buy-in and then how you screen for adverse events, um, particularly if they're not seeing a clinician when they come back, if it's just a, a pharmaceutical pickup or in the community-based models, I'm wondering how they monitored for, particularly for severe hepatotoxicity. Mm -hmm. Great, yes, yeah, so in terms of what the provider said, certainly they were trained in terms of some of the positive messages that probably that you heard about in the previous talk, but they also, very likely may have spent a little bit more time with patients answering questions. This is, again, our, our um, estimation or speculation. Um, and we are very curious to know whether the motivational interviewing um, affected it. This is, a, you know, in helping patients determine what matters most to them and um, what, what, what motivates them to um, change behavior. And again, very little behavior change was needed if their um, IPT was just folded into their ART, but some behavior change was required. So we are, go we are going to try to um, better unpack that. So adverse drug reactions, again, under routine programmatic conditions were monitored. Um, so that meant, yes, at visits, um, they would, um, would check in with the um, ART or HIV clinic nurse. Um, they certainly could present on their own um, if they had any um, adverse reactions, you know, for an, for an acute care visit. Um, but at every visit, they were assessed using, um, using a questionnaire. Um, and that's how, that's, again, under standard programmatic um, conditions. No, no blood tests, just symptoms. Okay, sorry, I may have uh, ignored the person at microphone one. I don't know if uh, she wants to come up. Uh, microphone two. 
Thank you for the presentation. Uh, most of the countries in Africa that are introducing uh, IPT are actually using uh, the symptom screen cough of more than two weeks mm -hmm. as a screening tool. Recent evidence is showing that uh, that may not be very effective and that uh, the x-rays may actually play a bigger role than the symptom screen. What are your thoughts about mm -hmm. the use of x-ray as a screening tool, as an ad adject, uh, ad additive to the screen, uh, symptom screen? Well, all I can say is that it seemed that the symptom screen was very effective um, in our 908 patients um, because of no confirmed cases of, of breakthrough TB. The, the Swaziland um, questionnaire is actually five questions, that, um, so it includes cough, fever, night sweats, um, chest pain, and weight loss, um, and it's slightly different for kids. It includes um, exposure to household contact. I don't know if a slightly expanded questionnaire um, symptom screen is, is um, a bit more sensitive, but um, that's what they were using in Swaziland. So I, I, this actually raised my confidence in the symptom screen. Um, so I, I would say that this, this seems to be working well and adding chest x-ray may be an unnecessary um, expense um, and, and, and uh, time, uh, time wasting event. The reason why I ask that is because the recent prevalence survey results are showing that uh, there are a lot of people out there who are asymptomatic mm -hmm. and they actually have uh, clear uh, TB signs in x-rays. Yes, yeah, so, th so it's certainly possible that some patients may be being missed by the symptom screen, um, but again, just our data don't bear that out. Okay, could I request that you make your questions quite brief, yeah. but uh, two remaining questions. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I'm Avinash. I work with the Global TB Program, uh, WHO. Uh, my question is about monitoring and evaluation uh, and the recording and reporting that involved uh, for uh, documenting the compliance. Uh, and this is one of the key challenge countries face to uh, uh, face. So while you plan scale up and at the national level, do you see it as an issue or uh, do you see a possibility of integrating into the existing uh, ART uh, recording and reporting. Certainly, I think the best hope for this to be t uh, this method to be taken up um, nationally and 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 uh, perhaps regionally or even globally would be that it is folded into the um, existing HIV um, care and treatment activities. There was obviously there would obviously need to be some initial inputs into um, initial training and adding of the documentation requirements that would be that would be needed. Um, we had to work with, you know, TB program, HIV program representatives, pharmac pharmacists at each of the sites. So there was some sort of startup work. And then if you don't have a home-based care for those few patients who may choose um, home-based, uh, community-based delivery, that might also be an added expense. But again, one of the things that we're also looking to do in addition to the qualitative study is to try to do some costing analysis to see what, what would sort of be the price tag that we would attach to trying to roll out something like this. Okay, microphone one. Yeah, Chikodi Anibogu, Nigeria. Uh, just a little bit of curiosity in terms of demographics. Mm -hmm. I thought I saw about 66% female. Yeah, I'm curious. Uh, is there any real explanation? Probably I missed why such uh, a disparity. I think that just is actually fairly representative of the HIV-infected population um, in Swaziland. We did consecutive enrollment, so as patients were coming in, they were, they were um, offered and enrolled. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our final speaker for today is Alison Rines. Uh, she completed this work that she's going to be presenting as part of her doctoral dissertation at Stanford. And uh, she continues her work as an affiliated researcher at Stanford, but now works for Johnson & Johnson. Thank you. This morning, I'm going to be speaking about modeling the implementation of isoniazid preventative therapy for TB control in a high HIV prevalence setting. As was previously mentioned, this work was conducted while I was at Stanford University, and the views presented here are my own and those of my co-authors, and do not necessarily reflect the views of Johnson & Johnson or any of its subsidiaries. As is well known to this group, active TB represents only a small fraction of the global burden of TB infection. As latent TB can result from both recent transmit, as active disease can result from both recent transmission of TB bacteria 
as well as the activation of latent infection, any discussion of active TB control must consider the role of treatment of latent TB. As has been previously mentioned by, by former presenters, isoniazid preventive therapy is both highly effective in preventing TB disease among individuals with evidence of latent TB infection, and its uptake in resource-constrained settings is also poor due to both resource constraints and logistical constraints. I'll just note that the WHO has issued guidelines recommending that IPT be made available to all HIV-positive individuals with latent TB infection. Former modeling work has indicated that IPT and treatment for latent TB in general will be an essential component of any global strategy to work toward the elimination of TB. In this work by Abu Radad and colleagues, you can see in the top three simulations treatment of active TB, and in the bottom two, treatment that includes latent TB. Some of the logistical challenges of providing IPT in resource-constrained settings include the diagnosis of latent versus active TB among HIV-positive individuals, as they can be difficult to distinguish, and accidentally treating an a person infected with active TB with IPT monotherapy can result in the emergence of drug resistance. Furthermore, IPT must be coupled to effective monitoring, both for treatment side effects as well as for the emergence of resistance. This plot shows latent TB prevalence and HIV prevalence in various age cohorts in South Africa. As you can see in the highlighted age cohort between ages 15 and 20, the prevalence of latent TB among this group is comparable to that of adults, while the prevalence of HIV is comparable to that of children. This means that this age cohort, by being provided IPT, stands to maximize its benefits in treating latent TB while minimizing its risks associated with misdiagnosis of latent TB among HIV-infected individuals. Furthermore, this group is, uh, will attend secondary school, meaning that the logistics of monitoring and screening for latent TB could be more easily done than in the general population. Therefore, we modeled the potential impact of a public health intervention providing IPT to South African secondary school students among whom latent TB prevalence is high HIV prevalence is low, meaning that the risks associated with drug resistance emergence are minimized, and the provision of school-based logistics are efficient. We constructed a deterministic co-infection model of TB and HIV infection, meaning that every individual in our model simultaneously participates in three sets of dynamics, TB infection, HIV infection, and demographic and population aging dynamics. For TB, we considered both recent transmission and act activation of latent TB. We considered providing dots for active TB, as well as IPT for latent TB. For HIV, we considered uh, ART dynamics in our model, as well as the recovery of CD4 count associated with ART. Finally, the model was calibrated according to key indicators of TB and HIV uh, prevalence, incidence, mortality, et cetera, um, in the area, and it was parameterized according to the literature. Furthermore, TB incidence was dynamically calibrated in response to the recent scale-up of ART that has taken place and been a driver of declines in TB incidence. We found that IPT drove significant gains in all key indicators of TB mortality and morbidity, including incidence, prevalence, and mortality. In our simulations, you can see that year zero, where the black line is, occurs in 2012, and our intervention starts in 2015. We compared 5% baseline IPT access in adolescents to an intervention providing IPT to 50% of adolescents, as well as providing IPT to 90% of adolescents. Though these data show incidence, the trends in prevalence, mortality, and other indicators were qualitatively similar. 
You can also see that declines in TB incidence as a result of IPT are most steep in the earliest years of the intervention. However, with each in, uh, added year, gains continue to increase. I want to note a couple of key sensitivity analyses which we performed. First, there's been some debate about the exact efficacy rate of IPT in preventing TB, active TB disease. And we found that the actual efficacy rate of IPT was significantly less important in driving TB incidence than the breadth of IPT provision, that it was, it was more effective at a public health level to provide IBT, IPT to a more significant part of the population than to understand exactly how effective it was. Second, though we primarily focused on the provision of continuous IPT, we did also look at the effect of stopping IPT and of IPT treatments of various course lengths. And we found that the rate of stopping IPT was directly correlated to TB incidence. That is, the longer IPT was provided, the lower TB incidence was in our simulations, which is consistent with d data from the Tibella and other studies. In summary, we constructed a model to examine the impact of a public health intervention for South African adolescents, among whom TB prevalence is latent TB prevalence is high, HIV prevalence is low, the effects of the ability to provide IPT in the secondary school system maximizes the efficiency of logistics of providing IPT. We found first that IPT drove gains in all key TB related indicators, including incidence, prevalence, and mortality. Second, we found that the rate of IPT cure was less important than the scale of IPT access in determining gains. And finally, we found a synergistic impact of IPT provision to adolescents. That is, even though only adolescents were provided IPT, we found declines in TB incidence across the entire population, including adults who did not receive the intervention. I'd like to acknowledge our funding sources and the intellectual contributions of our collaborators, and would be happy to take any questions. So while we're waiting for someone to come up to the mic, I was wondering what would the optimal age uh, that you would recommend for these adolescents to be started on IPT? And uh, what did you estimate the duration of IPT to be? So I'll, I'll take the second question first. Um, we primarily focused on continuous IPT. That is, in most of the simulations we conducted, IPT was assumed to be nonstop um, for this group. Um, although, as I said, we did look at the effect of, um, of treatment courses of, of various lengths. Um, and you find that the sooner you stop IPT, the, the more TB incidence increases. Um, as far as the optimal age, um, it would really be a resourcing question. And in terms of both the cost of providing IPT and the logistics surrounding monitoring for both um, side effects and the development of resistance. So part of the, adv or the advantage of providing IPT to this group is that you're able to, uh, to minimize that risk in a resource-constrained setting. So the, the wider, the, the more resources you have to manage the potential emergence of resistance, the greater your uh, age band could be. Okay. Hi, I'm Ellie Click from CDC. Um, had actually, a, um, well first, I really enjoyed the talk, and second, had a related question about whether you had um, looked in depth at, at sort of where you, uh, sort of the, the impact of moving the, the range of ages downward towards early adolescence. Um, I'm asking because, you know, the natural epidemiology of TB in children is, is biphasic. There's a large peak in incidence in the y very young children, less than five, and then there's a real nadir in incidence, and then it, there's an uptick in, in late adolescence, um, skewed towards girls who are also, you know, now, you know, headed towards, um, in some age groups, you know, um, uh, pregnancy and, and uh, having young infants in the home. So you can sort of re, re, um, renew the cycle, unfortunately, if, if TB is not prevented before the next generation of, of children is born into um, a household with TB. And, um, and then also in young adolescents, they're old enough to, to give sputum generally, and um, so diagnostic difficulties are also um, less problematic. So I'm wondering if there might be more of a sort of sweet spot for preventing TB before 
there's an uptick, a natural uptick in incidence um, in the younger adolescents, and that could also potentially intervene before there's the opportunity at all for um, for transmission, um, you know, among adolescents who have incident disease at the time of screening. This would really be before they would be expected to have incident disease if, if it was more in the sort of 10 to 12 year age group. That's a really interesting question. Um, we did not look at younger adolescents. We only looked at adolescents of secondary school age. Um, but you're right, that would certainly be an interesting analysis that we could repurpose the model to do. Okay, microphone one. Thank you very much. Um, Baskar from Robert Koch Institute, Germany. Um, you, th you, you showed the, the impact of IPT on the NTB incidents. I'm was wondering, is this effect due to the treating Latin tuberculosis or just like preventing the new uh, um, infection or stopping the procreation for active tuberculosis through new infections, especially we're talking about settings with high NTB incidence as a high transmission of TB. So, so so if I, if I understand correctly, you're asking whether the, the effect that we observed was due to the prevention of progression or due to preventing transmission. Exactly. Uh, it was primarily due to the pr preventing the progression of active TB, or sorry, progression from latent to active TB. How could you know? I mean, the, um, <laughs> we, we assumed in the model that this, that this was the key impact of IPT, and the model is structured in a way that the gains associated with IPT are observed in the progression pathway. Okay, well, are there, are there any other questions? Well, thank you very much uh, for that uh, great talk, and thank you very much to all our uh, speakers, and uh, a round of applause for them all.